Yep, yep. Oh, okay. Oh, you have to go ahead and turn your turn your camera back on, and then I can. Oh, an E a D. That's my grandma and my mom. Again, again. Okay, let me check the live stream to make sure that we are on. But we should be up and again, we are live. All right. Buenas and half a day todo sams bueno hudzung. Guawi host me zutalu, but it's the episode Fanatsu. Half a day, everyone. Once again, I am the host for the Fanatsu podcast. And um, with me today, I have, um, I'm trying to think of the, I'm sure that we will get into sort of this in our conversation. Uh, she has given us particular nicknames in relation to the diaspora <laughs> and engagement with the diaspora, but we will we'll see if we get into and if we reveal those nicknames. But Dr. Jesse Luhan uh, Bennett, uh, always nice to have another Luhan on the Finatsu podcast. Um, we Luhans, we need to represent. There's too many cruises. The, the Titanos sort of uh, take up a lot of space, but the Luhans, we need our time to shine as well. And so Dr. Uh, Jesse Luhan Bennett teaches in Aotearoa, and one of her passions as being a Chamorro who is from the diaspora is to find ways to grow and nurture Chamorro diasporic communities. And so I'm very excited as somebody, you know, myself who feels that um, connecting to the diaspora, connecting the Marianas and the diaspora in as many ways possible, and also encouraging those in the diaspora to form their own communities, to form their own networks. You know, this is something very close to my heart. And so I'm very happy to see uh, Jessie uh, um, focusing on this in her research. And I'm excited to hear what she has to say uh, for today's episode. Hey, Sidzus Masi, half a day, Jessie. Half a day, Maget. Sidzus Masi for having me here on today's Fanatio. I'm really excited to have this conversation. Again, and so, um, to get us started, why don't you uh, put forward, just go ahead and introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about your background. And I see you have a share, even you, you can even start with your virtual background right there. <laughs> sure. Um, I have a very plain white wall behind me. So I thought this is a great opportunity to kind of highlight some of my family members and my research. So this is my grandmother in the middle, um, Guadalupe Luhan, Guadalupe Garrido Blas Luhan, um, who is from Dededo. And then uh, this is my mother right here, Kathleen Luhan Vesevich, and my uncle Kelvin, Kelvin Luhan. Um, and this photograph was taken in the 60s in Hawaii, so in Oahu. So this is one of those um, diasporic mo movements, moments for my family when they first left um, Guahan. So um, I guess to introduce myself, so like you said, Guahu Si, Jesse Luhan Bennett. Uh, my grandmother's from Dededo. My grandfather, Jesus Luhan, is from Kenyatta Barragada. Um, I currently live in Aotearoa, New Zealand in the mighty Waikato, uh, but I was raised for the most part in San Diego, California, where we have a quite a large thriving diasporic community of Chamorros there. So I have many homes. I wish I could live in multiple places at once, constantly missing people and places all at the same time. Um, and that's kind of where my personal experiences lie in this diasporic context, but also where my you know, academic work is also rooted. Biba, Biba. And of course, uh, for those of you who don't know, both uh, Jesse and I attended University of California, San Diego. <laughs> and, That's and how so, I started on this journey, was meeting you. Hi, <laughs> Sidzus Masi. And so, um, so first off, most of the people who listen to Finanzu are familiar with, you know, diaspora, diasporic issues, even the term itself. Mm -hmm. But for the, but I still encounter some Chamorros who aren't familiar with the term and what it means exactly. And so can you just um, lay it out? What, you know, if you want to, you can get into sort of why we use that term or what it meant to imply. But also when we say diasporic communities, who are we usually referring to? Sure. Okay. So when we say diaspora or we start talking about diasporic communities, we're often talking about a particular group of people, a racial group, an ethnic group of folks who've left their homeland and have moved on to other geographic locations. Um, different kinds of people around the wor world use this term for their own communities. So for, for many folks, the most common time they hear diasporic or diaspora is with um, the slave trade that took place in the United States 
and this kind of out migration of um, Africans to the Americas. Um, some folks often hear it with the Jewish diaspora and that kind of out migration of folks from, from Israel and whatnot. So we have those contexts for diaspora, but when I use it with my work, I'm talking about the movement and migration of Chamorros um, outside of the Mariana Islands. So a lot of my research is focused on Chamorros who live in uh, the continental United States at this point, though Chamorros um, live in all sorts of places. So I'm sure some of our, our listeners have found Chamorros in, in Europe while they're traveling or ran into people in Asia. I know the five Chamorros that live in New Zealand at the moment. Um, so we are one of those groups that kind of are on the move Unlike some other diasporic communities, because of whatever reasons have moved their peoples, we don't cut ties, we don't sever our connections to our home islands necessarily. We tend to be in a constant dialogue and movement of, of people and ideas and goods and dreams and everything in between. Um, so if you're, you know, Agaguat, you might be sent to the States or vice versa. In the States, you might send, be sent back to the Marianas for funerals and for weddings and, and all of those big life celebrations, people are constantly on the move. Um, so we use diaspora, especially within academic context. I don't know if that's always the right word for us. You know, different kinds of folks have their own ways of describing the movements of their peoples. So maybe there's a term in tomorrow that we have or that we might come up with as a people to describe our specific kind of movement that's rooted in um, a long history of mobility, that also is rooted in a more contemporary migration of our peoples that is tied to the US colonization of our islands and the pathways that have opened up because of it. So long story short, I guess Cliff Notes version is that diaspora has many different ways of being used and for tomorrow's, maybe that's not the right term for us um, because of the, the nuance of our movements. But for me and my research at the moment, it, it kind of fits the conversation. Okay. No, Sidzus Masi for that. I think, um... You know, I remember first um, talking because, you know, of course, when I was growing up on Guam and even when I first went out to the States, you know, the term diaspora wasn't in common usage yet, um, at least not by most Chamorros. Um, but I remember having a conversation with my primo, Alfred Peredo Flores, who's uh, another Chamorro scholar in the diaspora. And he was talking about how, um, yeah, how Chamorro, when he, he was, you know, re learning about migration patterns and how... Chamorros didn't uh, tend to fit the usual way that immigration studies talked about, like migration, that Chamorros tended to move back and forth quite regularly. And part of that, of course, is the issue with uh, that U.S. passports, although, you know, Guam, unincorporated territory, but you still ease of ease, ease of access, the ease of travel between the, the, the Marianas and the states uh, mm -hmm. makes it so that you can, you know, flow back and forth across the Pacific. Um, but yeah, it's it's. I think it's a. Even just sort of hearing you describe it, I think it's that that's important. We don't want the Chamorro story to get lost, sort of in in typical narratives of just migration, you know, from other communities, or even just the way that sort of all these migration stories that prop up like the U.S. you know myths about sort of uh, you know. Um, meritocracy and pulling yourself up by your bootstraps and coming, you know, everyone wants to come to America and stuff like that. So it's it's good that you're getting into, you know, like the a lot of the specificities of the Chamorro experience in this. And so um, can you talk a little bit about um, the relationship between Chamorro migration and then militarization in the Marianas? Because I know that that's a key a key factor in terms of how Chamorro communities formed, right, in the states and, and why they move and so on. Right. Um, so if I preface our, our movement that's tied to the military with um, some other kind of movement discussion really quickly, um, it, we're having this new phenomenon of Chamorros moving in numbers that we've never seen before. Um, low, we have um, Chamorros have, that have been on the move since ever since, which is really um, fun to talk about in some contexts where it feels, sometimes it feels a bit heavy and, and hard to hear that, you know, Underwood has argued that um, in his earlier work that Chamorros are the, the, the thing that is on the go, that is our export from our islands. But when you put it within a larger context of, of movement, we've always been on the go. We are people rooted in mobility. We're known for our canoes. We're known for having those relationships with neighboring islands. We are a mobile people and that's, that's like at the heart of who we are. 
um, many times we've gone away and then we come back home, um, which is the thing that's kind of changing now in some, some respects. So just to preface that, so people are listening and they're like, yeah, I know that we move now and that's a new thing. And it's like, no, 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 we've always been on the go. It's just now it's new numbers. Um, in terms of the military being a pathway for our movement, and that's something that I'm looking at because we have so much discussion around how the militarization of our islands has had and continues to have detrimental impacts on our people, the land, the ocean, our skyscapes, et cetera. But um, as someone who grew up in the States, I'm also thinking about how can I contribute to this conversation to also problematize our movement and migration that's tied to the military. So I'll, I'll start with my own family to, have, to be an example of what this has looked like. And while this, is, this story is unique to my family, I think a lot of folks who are listening or, um, you know, are in adjacent to Chamorros, as you talked about uh, with some of our friends, you know, families that are close to Chamorros, they might have heard similar sto stories over time. So after World War II, for my family in particular, uh, from my grandfather's side, it was a hard time because of the devastation of the war, uh, because of family members being lost. And so folks are looking for ways to support their family. And with my grandfather, um, you know, it's you either have on-island connections for a job, or there's this new kind of um, job opportunities with the military that's being created. So the island is being rebuilt in ways that meets the needs for the US military agenda. And you also start to see the growth in jobs for um, recruitment into specifically the Navy. So my grandfather um, ended up joining the Navy, like many of his peers, and ended up leaving Guahan in the 60s. And this is, you know, right after Typhoon Karen, when the island is also going through another kind of wave of being rebuilt. And uh, then you start to see this outflux of uh, Chamorro families going abroad. So while the military is rebuilding our islands to fit its needs and introducing a wage-based economy that we've never had before in these kinds of um, ways that suit their needs, then we have folks like my grandfather trying to figure out like, what do I do for my family? And what are we, what do we do? So they ended up, you know, my grandmother and my grandfather left and were stationed in Oahu before they went to Long Beach and then to San Diego. And so that's, that's my family story. Um, and this is kind of military within my family that continued on. And, you know, I was an army brat for some time growing up. Um, it continues on. So you start to see the initial movements. And then sometimes there's that second kind of movement within families where we're moving around the states where tomorrow's, um, you can find us in every single state, all 50 states have us. We're the most widely dispersed Pacific group in the US and for every tomorrow, every three tomorrows that leave, only one comes home at this point. So not everyone who leaves at this point is tied to the US military, but by, I would say in the 60s and 70s, continuing today in some ways, um, the military continues to be a major conduit where the recruiters don't have to recruit, our, our people stroll into the door and sign up themselves. So we can critique the military on island and what it has done on a number of different levels for our people. But I come in going, so what does it mean for the, the movement of our people if the military then becomes one of very few job opportunities? Is it a choice in our movement? If you only have maybe one, two or three options, um, or I, I tend to argue that it's, it's not fully um, a choice. We do have agency as a people, but at the same time, what happens when we have very few options? The military becomes this massive conduit for our people and now has made it where we have thousands in the continent. No, thank you for, thank you for bringing that up. Just because um, it is, you know, part of the, the reality of it's, it's interesting because the, the connection to the United States for Chamorros in the diaspora is, as you said, it's firmly military for a long time. The, there's, of course, some exceptions, people who travel for school or stay out there. And then, as you mentioned, there's the people who leave because uh, their 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 gods they lost the election, and so they're they're you know they don't have any jobs you know <laughs> and stuff like that. And I remember when I went to the Guam Club in the Sons and Daughters of Guam Club in San Diego, uh, the, for the first time in like 2002 or 2003. There was uh, some old timers there who, as soon as I asked them, "Oh, what what brought you out here?" Oh, Lanya, my pedi, Godzuhu, my my Godzu lost, Tadza Tsotsu. There's no jobs on the island, you know, and and then stuff like that. And so, um, but it, you know, uh, <coughs> expensive. And so, um, you bring up that issue though, and it's so unfortunate because. In thinking about the, you know, or just the the lack, the perceived lack of opportunities, 
And, you know, for me on Guam, that's something that's, it's, it's true, but then it's also something that we assert as true uh, or assume as being true. Because I've heard from so many teachers, um, for example, that, you know, the military provides a reason not to prepare students not to encourage them to sort of seek a career because the idea is that the military will just gobble them up mm -hmm. and so many teachers have often lamented that reality i mean um uh just that you don't you really have to do that much to prepare them for life because they're all going to end up joining the military and they're going to be taken care of in the military right and it just becomes another way in which um you know we we become sort of we have this feeling of dependency on the United States. And so uh, thank you for bringing up sort of that that reality too, because we're 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 accustomed to thinking of it as sort of this this wonderful opportunity and it does provide opportunities for people. But it is also something that limits our imagination. and in some ways it keeps us from taking care of ourselves or sort of or like improving sort of the opportunities on our island, you know, because there is just this, this massive easy opportunity over here. Right, and um, you know, when I, so part of my research, um, I am very much interested in our festivals because, you know, that's one thing us Chamorros know how to do, along with, you know, this larger context of Pacific peoples, like we love a good gathering, we love a good festival, especially in our, our diasporas. And um, I recently wrote an article that's in the public arts journal that, um, You'll, you'll provide for folks if they're interested, where I look at the Chamorro Cultural Festival in San Diego. And it's one of those sites that I love to go to. I used to help quite a bit with SETLU, which is one of the social organizations in San Diego. And when I write about these coming togethers of our people and, and the buying of our things and eating of our food and listening to the music, and you just see thousands of Chamorros pour into these spaces, I love it. And I, as a kid, I used to show my friends, like, I told you we're real, you know, because and maybe that's another part of our conversation later. But, um, you know, this hyper invisibility of us um, as a people in the in the United States. So that was one of the ways I proved I was real. I was like, I told you we're people. Chamorros are real. Guamanians are real because we were using that word for some time, hoping to indicate to someone's ear they would hear the word Guam, you know, and know where that is. Um, but when I when I write about our festivals and these gatherings, I think about like how awesome it is that we have thousands of us and we pour in from all over the West Coast. We have people coming in from Texas, like you name it and we come. Um, but at the same time, it is one of those like other kind of painful things we have to think about. Like, why are there thousands of us in the States? You know, what brings us together in these ways is our Chamorroness, not necessarily the military that kind of connects us, you know, in these different spaces. You know, and we're meeting in a place like San Diego, California, that has um, such a massive naval presence. So, you know, that's kind of the elephant in the room where we get together and we're having these, you know, fiestas and everything. It's like, well, why are there so many of us in these spaces? How can thousands of, thousands of us get together in this way? And so then you got to think more critically about the military's kind of, um, you know, hand in all of this, where for some, they can argue this has been an institution that has given their families upward mobility that has allowed them to experience the world in different ways on and on and on. Um, and then at the same time, we go, this thing that has enabled your upward mobility in some respects has also um, caused a lot of pain and violence for both folks back in the Mariana Islands and those um, in the States as well. So it's, it's that kind of underlying thing as well that allows thousands of us to be together. So it's a source of some upward mobility, but it's also a source of immense oppression for our people. So how do you make sense of that in a diasporic context? That's also on another indigenous people's land. So the layers to what we can talk about as diasporic tomorrows, not only our responsibility to our home islands, but also to the people's lands in which we now reside is, is difficult, you know? And these are things that we have to work through as a people. And sometimes, I don't know if our, our conversations are there quite yet, you know, even the thing like, do we talk about ourselves as dice work? Not everyone uses that language yet. It's a newer term. So we're getting there. Um, but I, as an academic, I think like, what does it mean that we're on another people's land? What does it mean that while there's so many of us together that we can experience our tomorrowness as one, um, it's really complicated by the fact that we're in a, a, a naval city that has brought so many of us away from our islands to begin with. No, so just want to say thank you for that. <clears throat> no, thank you for that. I think um, 
Hmm. I wanted to, I actually, so put for but para hamzu todos ni umeega para umeekunok. I've put into the comments on the Facebook uh, Fanatsu live stream a link uh, to Dr. Jesse, Dr. Luhan Bennett's uh, article that she was referencing, Iseng Song San Diego. And so feel, please feel free to check that out. And remember, if you have any questions, I can go off and I send me to put for what pega comments, go ahead and put them into the comments. Um, and so do, can you talk to us a little bit more about uh, the, this article uh, that, that, you're, that you're sharing, the yeah. Iseng Song San Diego? Yeah, uh, so there's uh, a ton of us tomorrow's in San Diego. So I was lucky enough where I grew up in a space where even though we don't live in ethnic enclaves, you know, we don't have a, a Chamorro town or Chamorro um, block or anything like that. We have a very vibrant um, scene in terms of social cultural organizations over time. So since my grandmother has been in San Diego, um, you know, starting in the 70s to, you know, me in 2022, we have really awesome groups that if you're looking for a community and you're looking for a place to be with other Chamorros, you know, we got them. So with the article that I wrote, um, I was really looking at our festivals because that has been, along with the social and cultural organizations, our festivals have been a really important way for me to find other Chamorros, um, to buy everything and anything that says Marianas and Guam and Chamorro, like you name it. That was a time I saved my pennies and we would go to these, these places and buy these things, which I would argue is not a superficial thing to buy stuff that says who you are and where you're from. Just, you know, for those that are listening, it is, it is meaningful. And we are trying to signal to folks all over the place that we are not of here, that we come from the most beautiful islands in the world. And that, um, yeah, our genealogies connect us beyond, you know, for me, San Diego, California. So I use the, the article as an opportunity to talk about our festival. Um, right now we have quite a few um, in San Diego, but I specifically talk about the Chamorro Cultural Festival, where it has been growing exponentially over the past 10 years. Um, you know, we started off in uh, a smaller space in central San Diego over at the Jacob Center, where, you know, a couple thousand of us came out. But, you know, once you blow that Kulu, like people hear it and they start coming, and then all of a sudden we cannot fit into that space and to that parking lot. We don't have enough restrooms. So um, we are over at the Cal State San Marcos uh, campus now that actually suits you know, the amount of people that are coming. I think they guesstimated we're hitting close to 10,000 or so now over the, the weekend days. And um, so what I do with my work is, okay, so why are we getting together? What has made thousands of us um, find one another? What does it mean that we are, are buying things that say who we are? What does it mean that we are looking for our foods and we spend a whole weekend finding accommodations if we don't live in San Marcos? Um, finding flights down, uh, caravanning down to, to be a part of this. And um, so this is one of many festivals and tomorrow gatherings that we have, but um, I focus on that one primarily because it's, it's newer and it, it comes from things like PIFA, the Pacific Islander Festival Association, which is more like Pan Pacific and tomorrow's tend to dominate that space along with some other groups. Um, but we were so big that we have enough people where we can run our own own festivals. So I, I'm a bit critical of our movements. I think about ways that we can problematize the military's influence in our communities, as well as um, the continued movement of our people. And, you know, how can we use our festival spaces, not only to celebrate who we are, which is so important to have that, um, especially in a, a country that we are hyper invisible in, but also how can we use these spaces to talk about the hard questions? You know, why are we here? Um, what does it mean that we're on Kumi Island? What does it mean that um, so many of us are tied to the military? What does it mean that our islands are looking towards new political futures and how as diasporic people can we be in service to those back home who you know, um, hold things down for us while we live abroad and make new communities? So if anyone is interested, check out the article because that's, that's exactly what I get into. Again, put for but link is on the it's on the Fanatsu Facebook. So Fanatsu is it goes out on three different platforms, but the link right now is on the uh, Facebook Fanatsu live stream. And so, um, I did want to ask. We're getting some questions; they're coming in, but I did want to ask one more question because uh, before we get to the the viewer questions, and that is, um, you know, because at different moments, sort of the 
there's always an interesting tension, like an under an undercurrent, a tense undercurrent to off island tomorrows, on island tomorrows, and so on. And at different moments, I think it flares up. I mean, I've seen it a few times flare up on Twitter, even though I'm not on Twitter. But uh, you can always tell if somebody is on Twitter because they will talk to you about whatever is on Twitter, and you will just be confused. Really, what's what's interesting? Okay. But I do know that on social media, every once in a while, there's flare ups where sort of the assertions of Chamorros in the States not getting it or the assertions of Chamorros back home not getting it. And I think, um, you know, one of the one of the things that in my own sort of historical analysis, though, I think people oftentimes miss that sort of uh, the movement into a new space in which you are forced to confront different things about your reality can be very important, whether it is going from the diaspora into the Marianas or going from the Marianas into the diaspora. Because so many of the stories of Chamorros who resisted most directly sort of colonial impositions or colonial systems, let's say in the 1940s, after World War II, a lot of them did that because they had been in the, they had been outside of the Marianas at one point. The late Carlos Taitano, for example, who was a part of the Guam Congress walkout, his part of his coming to consciousness was realizing when he was in Hawaii, the fact that sort of brown people in Hawaii didn't worship the U.S. Navy like Chamorros did. So that what he had assumed from growing up that sort of you were supposed to give reference, deference and respect to anybody in the uniform, that people elsewhere didn't do that. And so even um, Situn Antonio White, who has been on Finanzu before with his son, Alex, and he was in the, the two-week immersion program that we just had on Guam for the Chamorro language, you know, his father, uh, you know, was felt he was discriminated against for his wages and then went all the way to the States to, to protest sort of that experience and realized that he was completely getting. And so... You know, I want, I'm wondering if you can kind of talk about that, that, tr that sort of that experience of, of getting out of your, your sort of your learned embedded context, and then how then um, moving back and forth across the Pacific can be important, taking the lessons that you learn, right, taking, and so I'm wondering if you can kind of uh, share a little bit about, about that in your uh, experience or analysis. Sure. So the, the moving back and forth, I'll start off by saying, um, I know I'm really privileged in being able to make these movements um, back and forth between the islands and San Diego, um, being able to go to graduate school in Hawaii and then now living in New Zealand. Like I have a very particular kind of experience of understanding my Chamorroness, but a lot of that is layered in privilege because I know that's not, these movements are not afforded to everyone. So I just wanted to start off by saying that. And a lot of the early movements of Chamorros, you know, in the pre-war and after, um, especially when it comes to like education and stuff, like these aren't, these are Chamorros that are coming from very privileged families as well that, you know, um, that allows for the movement. So I just wanted to start with that. Um, but in terms of moving back and forth, there's a lot of learning that, that happens. Um, I am thankful that I grew up in an intergenerational household with a, a Chamorro grandma that is very tomorrow and like makes it known. And, you know, I've, I've talked with you again about, you've met my grandmother and she, this woman right here, this face that she's making that the, the yelling, she's probably laughing and saying some crazy stuff, but it's been really helpful to have her in my life because um, she's really grounded me in my tomorrowness and you're going to know it, that this is who you are from the get-go. And she's the oldest of 21. And so even though she's based in San Diego, she knows everything that's happening with her siblings and still is very much like the Maga Haga, even though she lives abroad. So I think that's also helped me a lot in terms of um, understanding my place in this larger picture of our movements. So I know that we have a lot of um, ideas of one another across these spaces. Those I, you know, I'm a dice fork tomorrow, but I'm currently in Gohan. So at the moment, I'm not dice fork. So this is awesome. But, you know, we have these ideas of one another that I hear. And like you said, I hear it from, I'm not on Twitter, thank goodness, because that seems like a crazy toxic space. And some of the problematic things I hear of people, tomorrow's in the States saying about those on island and those here within the island saying about those in the States, it's just, um, it's, it doesn't help in any kind of like bridging of communities and trying to understand each other's context. And I tell my students, 
I tell other tomorrows that I hang out with that we really have to be easier on one another because um, there are a lot of us and we have very different ways of understanding our tomorrowness. So being tomorrow in San Diego is not the same as being tomorrow here in Guam. It's totally different. We have overlap in things, um, but we have different contexts, different social, cultural, geographic contexts that shape us in different ways. So we're still tomorrow. We're tomorrow for mix. We're tomorrow if we live abroad. We're tomorrow if we're here within the Marianas. But also um, the nuance of our experience is really important that we acknowledge when we tell our stories, when we try to relate to one another. And you know, having a grandmother like Miss Guadalupe Lujan here um, made it so that when I come home. I'm, I'm part of a huge family and I've also learned from her that you just have to, especially if you're coming back home, um, relax, like be quiet, don't say too much, chill out for a minute because we didn't grow up in this context. So we think we know something in the States, but that is a one particular way of being tomorrow. When you come here and you want to be of help and you want to be in service and you want to be in community, part of that is also taking a step back and allowing folks to tell you like what it's been like here and where you can help and where your skills could be utilized. So for me, rather than coming in and trying to um, assert myself or my work or my understanding of being tomorrow, um, I've always just, just take it, you know, step back, help like swat the flies at the fiesta, hang out and make sure that your hands aren't empty. You come to things with a, with a gift, you, you always come ready to help. You make sure that you're moving things around and that you're, again, hands are never empty. And, um, and that goes a long way. And then you're showing up for people. And part of it too is like seeing your face and whether that be in 2022, like here in a platform like this, we, are, we see each other, but also when we are um, coming here and starting to be a part of these different organizations or wanting to be of help, it's like, sometimes people got to figure you out. They got to find out who your family is, which village they're from. They want to understand you. And again, in this larger context, um, because you, you don't come alone. Um, so for me, as someone that's coming back and forth and taking time and space and all these different tomorrow communities, um, part of it is just taking a beat and a step back and allowing others that actually live here to tell us what they need. Because sometimes from my own um, context in the States, I hear folks think that they know what folks here in the Marianas need. And I'm like, we, we can't assume that we know what folks need here because we don't live in this context. But Part of it in bridging those kind of gaps and, and being closer is, is asking and, and having formats like this where we could talk online. When you come home and you show face, um, it's building rapport and it's gaining trust because we are insiders in one way, we're all tomorrow, but also we come from different contexts. And it's the same with those folks that are coming from the islands into our communities. I've heard all sorts of stuff from my grandma about folks that have gone to the Guam Club, and this is not directed at you, Maget, but you know, like some folks that'll come and assert themselves and say, this is what you need to do as tomorrows. This is how we do it in the islands. And they're going, that's, but that's not how we, we do it here, you know? And you can't tell us to spell tomorrow a certain way, or you can't tell us to do this and that. Like we say what we want. And, um, and that's always fun to just kind of be a fly on the wall and watch. But also it is just respecting the context in which we are all um, living and thriving in right now. So we can work together, but also recognizing being tomorrow in Tacoma is not the same as San Diego, is not the same as, as Mong Mong, you know, it's it's all very different. Yeah. Again, no seduce massing. <laughs> Thank you for that. I think, um, and you're getting a lot of positive comments uh, and support sort of uh, for your <laughs> reflection on that. Never, never have your hands, <laughs> make sure your hands are never empty. Put favor, guide respect to fan. And so we have uh, some questions coming in. One of them comes from Auntie Antoinette sat for us half a day, senora. And so she would like to know your thoughts on the issue of sort of the label diaspora itself. And so first part, why is it uh, Maput, why is it difficult for some Chamorros to embrace the term diaspora? And then um, she also mentions that some key Chamorro leaders reject the term diaspora because it discounts or shames Chamorros from the diaspora. And so do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, um, I've never seen diaspora as a dirty word in the same ways that when people call us activists, I'm like, that's not a dirty word, it just means I'm active. Um, so with, with diaspora, I don't see it as a dirty word. I just see it as one of those terms that work in some context for people, but a lot of times it does not. Um, part of it, I started to hear more tomorrows use it um, outside of the islands 
when FESPAC was coming around in 2016 and we had this like diasporic part of the, the Guam delegation, which I thought was really interesting. It wasn't that we were just in the Chamorro, it wasn't a Chamorro delegation, it was island specific, which is a whole nother thing, but also talking about it as, well, we have these diasporic ones coming rather than going, no, we have Chamorros that are coming back home to be a part of this. So I, I started to hear more folks use it. Part of the reason why I don't think we hear a whole lot of it is it's a, to me, it's a very, um, it's like academic jargon. Like people are still trying to wrap their heads around it and it, it doesn't roll off the tongue. And like, you know, when you teach us um, tomorrow, it's, we like harmony. We like our language to sound nice. And when you hear diaspora, it sounds like a medical term. It, it's not, it's not the most uh, pleasing word to use. Um, and I, I think on a deeper level, I don't know if the kind of basic understandings of diaspora, you know, movement of people away from their homelands and then they cut ties really works for our context because of the cyclical nature, like I said earlier, of our people's movements, our ideas that move, uh, the goods that we send back and forth and everything in between. So in some contexts, I don't think a diaspora works. And within Pacific and Indigenous Studies, which I teach into um, in Aotearoa, I teach a class about diaspora and movement of Pacific peoples. And majority of my students, um, you know, like maybe 30 of them, by and large are all Pacific. And in one context or another are, are diasporic. So one of the activities we do is really take apart the idea of what a diaspora is and its, and its terminology and definition and ask like within your people's context, do you have other kinds of ways to describe the movements of your folks over, over time? Do we have other words that might be more useful within your communities? Um, you know, are there other ways that we can describe ourselves and our movements because diasporas don't, it doesn't always work. So within the field of diasporic studies, you know, I make arguments like how can we, how can we kind of blow this term up to say, some of us don't cut ties. We're very much connected to our islands. Um, we are moving around back and forth and in between. We're also indigenous. So it adds another layer about as indigenous folks who are genealogically connected to a place that are of a place, what does it mean when we don't live in our home islands anymore? Um, how does that complicate the word diaspora? So I, I agree with um, Antoinette, whose parents are actually, were very close to my grandmother and I grew up with in San Diego. Um, but I, I agree that diaspora is not always the right term. And I put it on my students and I throw it out to other folks like maybe there's a better way to describe this movement um, for our people. And there are examples of, of other indigenous communities finding their own terminology to describe the movement that is more nuanced. Um, so I, I throw that out to folks as well. If there's anything, if there's a word or a phrase that we can use that better describes it, I'm all for it. Um, because I think our movement is like other indigenous folks, it's like other Pacific peoples, but our movement is unique to ourselves as well, which I think makes it all the more interesting to research and to talk about. No, Sidusmasi Anti Antoinette Puri I think um it's it's a it's a delicate thing because um I think um the, the greater interest that Chamorro, that sort of newer generations of Chamorros in the diaspora have with in connecting home or learning more about their roots. I think it's 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 powerful and it's important that we support that, we nurture that, we give them the resources. But then it also then just uh it leads to that question that, well, if if we're all Chamorro, then why why give the majority of the population, which now lives outside of the Marianas, why give them this label, right? But Going to what you've mentioned so far, and 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 you've also gotten support for it in the comments too, is just sort of that idea that you know you you shouldn't let your experiences in the diaspora overwhelm or dictate sort of uh, the experiences of those back home. But just as just in the same way as which a Chamorro from from Guam or Saipan, CNMI shouldn't then go and tell Chamorros in San Diego how to how to how to live their lives, right? Or how to say the Nobena. Well, actually, wait, no. You should say the Nobena in Chamorro. I don't care where you are, even if you're in like Laramie, Wyoming, or or I don't know, Cheese, Cheese Town, Wisconsin. Put for what? Just say it in Chamorro. You can get through it. But um, and so uh I think it's important though that we don't um, you know, because <clears throat> that we don't um iron over or sort of smooth out or do away with the particularities, the particular struggles, right? Because 
there is always this feeling like uh, those in, in home feel like, oh, those in the diaspora have it really easy. And then there's also sometimes this feeling like, oh, those in the those back in the islands have it really easy. And there's always just this feeling. And, and so it's kind of like, I think, yeah, respect, respect, and then find the ways to connect, right? Sort of stop with the assumptions, the assumptions sort of, uh, the assumptions that, oh, my favorite thing, though, because you were talking about what, you know, Chamorros in the States thinking will fix the islands. Chamorros all in the States always used to say that you could fix the islands with, uh, by uh, bringing a franchise or a giant store there. They always say, oh, you know what Guam needs? It needs a Walmart. Or you know what Guam needs? It needs a Costco. And I remember hearing that and being like, man, I had day. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, it, it's it's interesting to hear the, the assumptions and the stereotypes, you know, like these folks couldn't make it in this context or those ones couldn't make it in another and, you know, um, but like we're both saying, I think we need to be easier on ourselves and a bit more understanding. I think, um, cause I'm coming from abroad, I'm coming from San Lago, and I think for those of us in the States, we can make our own orgs and we can do our own thing, but also, you know, what is our responsibility to the home islands? And in that context, you know, taking a, taking a beat, taking a back seat, allow those here to, to kind of um, lead us in what, what they need help with and, and, and things like that. So I try not to be the loudest in the room. Um, I try to sit back and for me and my own commitment to things, like I try to come home every year in the summertime here, I, I try. And part of it is because I love it here and I love my, you know, seeing my family, my friends here, but also it is showing face and being in service and making sure that um, for my own work and, and the things that I'm doing that I keep those, those connections tight. So if you're listening and you haven't been home in a long time or you've never been, um, I highly suggest saving those pennies. Cause again, I know that it is a privilege to come here and it's not something that is affordable at all because of United Airlines having this monopoly and charging us exorbitant amount of fees to come home, which is a whole nother problem where when we're trying to connect, but we can't afford to come home, what does that mean? And even for us to connect to go from Guahan up to Saipan, it's like a ridiculous amount of money. So that also can have a strain on the ways that we can to be close to one another. Low, I think that don't stop in Hawaii. Like we are not Hawaiian, do not stop there and be like close enough, got there, a lot of tomorrows. And it's like, we're everywhere. You can go to San Diego and have a tomorrow experience, but Hawaii's not cutting it. Like you need to save the rest of that cash and keep going West because there's nothing that's gonna replace hopping off the airplane and getting your bags out of, you know, baggage claim and hearing someone talking tomorrow about now you need to proceed over to immigration and TSA. Like it just doesn't hit the same walking out of the airport and getting hit with that muggy air um, and seeing the view of the island, like it's not the same as stopping in Hawaii. So I know for a lot that is as close as we could get, but I would also really push folks to, 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 to try to get home. It's okay to try to get home when you can and, and, and not necessarily just for funeral or for a wedding, like make it a, an intentional trip where you come home to reconnect, because I know that could be powerful for a lot of folks who are looking for ways to, um, to explore their chamorroness in a, in another way. Okay. No, I definitely. And, and, um, I, if, if you were, if, if Guam Visitors Bureau is not watching, you should definitely give uh, Dr. Luhan Bennett here a contract for sort of this is the type of uh, uh, visitor engagement I'm just kidding that we need uh, but but it, it's you know it's such it's such a good point is that uh you know bringing people back but not bringing them back you know but bringing them back in a way in which sort of they can they can remember roots or they can find roots that were denied to them or lost to them but you know this is it's such a powerful thing and we should encourage more Chamorros to not be afraid of it. I think that um, after um, you know living in the in the diaspora for a while for school, and then sort of teaching in Zoom for like three years now, uh, mainly diasporic Chamorro students, it's uh, you know it's 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 interesting because for I think for a lot of people it's just that you know the 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 label Chamorro or the identity the heritage that you were given for so long is for some, it's very marginal, it's very minimal. And to, to try to unpack it opens up all these questions, right? I've had so many students talk to me and, 
And when they're learning tomorrow in Zoom, they're just like, they, they, they feel emotionally wrecked because why didn't my parents teach me this? Or why didn't my grandparents teach me this? Or, you know, and so I know that for a lot of people, it's just easy. It feels easier to just kind of accept the smallness of what you might have been given in terms of what your roots are. But, you know, Guam is, or, you know, finding that though is something that, yeah, you know, it's worth more than all the Walmarts and the Best Buys in the world. But yeah. I wanted you, if you, if you don't mind talking about that, cause I know that you, you yeah. know, what brings you to this conversation is the fact that you love to engage with Chamorros in the diaspora and a lot of people who, you know, have, have a, na- have a last name that's Chamorro. But then when people say, Hey, are you Chamorro? They're kind of like, uh, yeah. Or, Oh wait, what this is what I heard in San Diego and it and it chilled me to my to my bone marrow was people saying I would come up to go up to somebody and say, Hey, are you Chamorro? And they'd be like, I'm not Chamorro, but my 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 parents are. Oh no, we don't do that. <laughs> oh no, no, no. You own that. Um yeah, we're not Guamanian, we're not Saipanese. I mean, you could be, you could be those things, but you know, I wasn't raised in Guam, I wasn't raised in Saipan, I was raised in California. So if anything, I would be a Californian. But I'm tomorrow. Like my family is genealogically connected to these islands. We are of this place. And that is, that's awesome. I think it's such a cool thing where, you know, maybe they say in terms of size, like we're from a very small island, we're a very small community of people. And I go, no, like size is relative and it's a perspective. And we, our ancestors, speaking of mobility, you know, we, we weren't limited to our land spaces. We, we connected through the water and our skyscapes. So we're actually quite expansive people. It's just, we have internalized the smallness that we reiterate so many times. So for that first and foremost, like if you're tomorrow, you're tomorrow. If you have a tomorrow woman in your family, you're tomorrow. So just own it. And maybe you're Guamanian, but you know, for, for some of us, our families in the States, we, we use that still because that was kind of, um, one of the identity markers and things that was used when our grandparents left island, like the island was really pushing, you know, with the influx of immigrants and whatnot to have this island wide identity. But for us as indigenous folks, it's like, no, we're tomorrow, we're of a place and you don't have to hesitate to say that that's what you are. So scream it from the rooftops because if you're tomorrow, you're tomorrow, period. Um, I think with, you know, um, in the States, I, I was also going to say something about for, for some, they might talk about tomorrows in the States as being like t-shirt tomorrows. Like we just have it on our shirts or we have it on our hats or the bumper stickers on our cars or the flags on our cars. And I have all those things, like all of the above. And I don't care if I'm in New Zealand, like we're also gonna have that on my car. <laughs> Even though people are like, what? Are you Hawaiian? Like mahalo. I'm like, no, 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 we are, we are from a different island community as you can see by the sticker on my car. But there's, there's nothing superficial about that either, I would argue. You know, the, the t-shirt tomorrows and everything in between is a, is a valid way of expressing who you are. And I, you're signaling to others, like I said earlier, that you are of a place. So for me, making connection and finding community, I look for those signals. I am on hyper alert when I go back to the States. So for instance, when I'm in San Diego and I get, get in the car with my sister, I see those, those decals on the cars and I will take pictures of them. Some folks will have it in their license plate frames, all of that. And again, I, I don't think it's superficial. And I always try to make it a point to say half a day. And I try to tell folks that I'm mentoring or new friends that I have that are tomorrow. It's like, your duty as a tomorrow is to say half a day when you see folks signaling to the world that they are of our islands. So I've said half a day to folks in grocery stores and they are freaked out for like two seconds. And then all of a sudden we're friends. Um, I make sure, you know, on the airplane, especially if you're, in your, if you're on United Airlines, um, you will find tomorrows on your flights. You will find other Micronesian folks on your flights as well. So don't, don't hesitate to say hi. Um, I've heard accents. And so at the end of a flight, I've talked to, you know, an old, old man and I was like, hi, are you tomorrow? And he's like, how could you tell? And I said, you sound like my grandmother. I love it. Like, I wish I sounded like you, you know, and I, and I have a new friend. And then all of a sudden I got a business card and you know, that, that kind of thing. I've sat on airplane rides where I looked over at the lady's arm and I saw her gold. So, you know, we're signaling to the world that we're of a place and she has all seven. She probably had more like 12. And, um, and she had her rings on as I do. And she had, you know, all these things. 
And I look over and I just ask, you know, like, are you tomorrow? And she's like, yeah. And we start uh, chatting. And then uh, she asks, as always, like, who's your grandmother? Who's your mother? And they all know this woman. So they're like, oh, your grandmother's Lou Luhan. I know Lou. I'm on my way to Texas to see my grandbabies before I come back and then head back to Guam. So you just have to say hi and you don't know how you're related or how you might be in communication or in connection in community. I've been in Las Vegas where my cousin was like, that guy over there is tomorrow. He's a Tobis. Go say hi. I'm like what? <laughs> and I go say hi. And I tell them who the Tovises are that have married into my Bloss family. And then we're in the VIP section <laughs> like at a table in Vegas. And it's, it's always about who you know and just saying half a day. And that has afforded me like my like awesome connections professionally. It has offered me awesome connections for my wider family. It has offered me, you know, awesome friendships that I have. You just have to say half a day. So for me, when I go to conferences and things where I know um, there, there's a possibility of tomorrow's being there, I pull up the programs, I command F. So if anyone's listening and you don't know what command F is, it's one way to search a document. Command F and I put in Guam, Guahan, Mariana Islands and spell tomorrow all three ways and see what pops up. And then you go greet folks and you say half a day. And I found that um, you immediately have friends, even if it's just for that moment, typically you, you actually become friends for forever. So I like to call it the Chamafia because I'm always looking out for them. And now you're like in my little, my little circle. Um, but really it is, it, it's, it's a Chamorro thing too, to be in connection, to look after folks, to, to provide what you can and to, um, you know, be in reciprocity, help folks out. It always comes back around. And part of it is if you are comfortable in your chamorro and you have resources to share and you share it and you make space at the table for others. And sometimes, you know, I have um, friends and colleagues who are Chamorro and have worked, you know, parallel to tomorrow issues because they're afraid to dabble in um, to some of the things that we're going through. And I'm like, don't go parallel, just jump right in because people will welcome you. Even if you hesitate and even if you're like real cautious and you don't know if you're overstepping things, it's always good to be cautious if you're dice work. But um, I say just hop in and tomorrow's that I've, I've encountered here in the Marianas and my family is a huge part of this. It's like, they're always welcoming when you come home. Even if you've never been here, they'll say, Welcome home. We're so glad that you're here. So I just say, go for it. You know, don't hesitate. Be cautious, come empty handed. But I say, just jump right in because that, that's your birthright. Again, I think, um, Noah, what you're describing there, I think that's why uh, it's always important to remember Mamalo, you know, is important, but there's different ways to understand Mamalo. You should definitely be mamalo to your elders. <laughs> you should definitely be guy mamalo, guy respect, right? But that doesn't mean that you should be quiet and and, and embarrassed and shy, right? Because Chamorros are definitely not necessarily that type of person. I mean, that type of people. Colonization in some ways kind of made us feel real small, made us feel like we should kind of disappear into the jungle or disappear into the uniform or you know disappear but um but I love what you're describing is be respectful be you know be guy mamalo to those who deserve it usually you know but be be open and and be I don't want to say time mamalo because that sounds bad but you know be <laughs> but just don't be embarrassed about sort of asserting uh, that you come from the Marianas, that you come from Guam or the CNMI, you know, because, um, you know, there's there's a couple, there was what, 200,000 or so Chamorros in the world. We don't have time or the numbers to be Mamalo. You know, we should all be, uh, we should all be like you. We should all be Chamorro hunters. Not, oh, that sounded bad. Never mind. That sounded terrible. Chamorro Stalkers. No, tomorrow stalkers also sounds pretty bad. Yeah. Um, Keep your people tomorrow... out. <laughs> Wayfinders. <laughs> um, and, you know, if there's like 200,000 of us or whatever the number is, it's like, how lucky are we of this, this group, this smaller group of populate, you know, population to, to say that we are of this place, you know? So with my students who are from all these other Pacific places um, in my classes, I'm like, at the end of this class, you will know X, Y, and Z about the first content, but you will also know that Guam is, or the Marianas 
is the most beautiful place on earth. And they're like, why you can't say that? I'm like, well, you haven't been. So I want to make that claim. And you're going to know it tomorrow. Like you, we have to expand the ways that we understand um, also our Pacificness or it cannot be Polynesian centric. And we have to be inclusive of the rest of our blue continent. And I was like, and for some of you, how lucky you got a tomorrow professor because there's only so many of us and how lucky are you to be with, with the Chamorro, you know? Like we come from the best place. How lucky is that? How lucky are we? Um, so I, I encourage my students to who are of these other Pacific places who are wondering about their movements of their peoples. I said, you know, go explore, ask the questions, talk to your family, you know, find out what your story was. And in this context of being in Aotearoa, you know, Maori have their own movements, you know, they move around their country, there's uh, urban movements of peoples. They go abroad for jobs and things like that. But we also have all these other Pacific groups that now also call Aotearoa home. And they're moving for all sorts of different reasons that are really interesting to think about in relationship to our own movements with the US military and, and education and things like that. So for, for sports, because New Zealand is also, um, you know, a, a colonial power in its own right with the realm countries, the kinds of labor schemes that they have with agriculture and domestic work. And I think about what is that, what does that mean for my students, but also how's that in relationship to tomorrow's, or maybe it's quite different and how interesting to see these massive movements of Pacific peoples, but we all have our own kind of flavor to why and where we're going and things like that. No, Sidus Masi, we are up. Senora Linda Calvo, oh, Sidus Masi, she's a Fanatso patron and she suggests tomorrow seekers. Ooh, I like that. It'll make Harry Potter fans happy too. Tomorrow Seekers. And so um, I wanted to give you a, a last chance here because, um, you know, so many of the people actually who support Fanatsu, who are patrons for Fanatsu, a lot of them are tomorrows in the diaspora who have not, who feel like they have been very disconnected from tomorrow conversations, from like a lot of the you know, a lot of the things the, that are happening in the Marianas, you know, they may, you know, they may just have like, as you said, like a t-shirt sort of from Guam. And that may be sort of the only real connection or, or perhaps they remember the big fork and spoon, the wooden fork and spoons on the walls or something like that. Right. And so you've, you've given some suggestions on ways that people can join the Chamafia. Mm -hmm. And so do you have any other suggestions for ways that people can, um, can get connected can learn more because, you know, a lot of this is a lot of the conversation today is talking about how, you know, people in the diaspora can get connected or get sort of uh, educated, sort of learn more, but also then how we can connect across the Pacific islands and the, and the diaspora. And so um, I do want to point out that uh, Auntie Antoinette Zapfras is reminding us that the Masakata Collective is a great new uh, network sort of for, for Famalawan and then for gender fluid Tautau. And sort of it was, uh, it's primarily diasporic, but it is strong connections to movements that are happening in the islands. And so I did want to to highlight them. And so um, final thoughts and suggestions, put for what? Um, the first thing I would say is if all you have is a t-shirt or all you have is this podcast right now, um, that's that's okay too, right? That That is an experience. That is something that you're working through. So my biggest thing right now where I am in my life is to tell folks to just be easier on themselves. Like it's easy to get really angry when you start learning more about our people's history and movements and things. Um, it's easy to get angry at your own family because you're like, why are we in this context? Why do I feel like I have, you know, a void in, in myself and my identity making and et cetera. So I just say be easier on yourself. Your experience is valid and it's still a tomorrow experience because of who you are and where you're tied to. Um, for those of us in dice workspaces, we have to work a little bit harder to be connected to one another, to be connected to other tomorrows, to be connected to the Marianas. Um, but it's it's not impossible. Like look at the two of us talking right now. Like there are so many ways that you can connect. So one is um, I would at the basic level turn to your family, like talk to your family members. Um, I think our our elders, our families as a whole are just rich resources of stories and memories that we inherit. So even if you haven't been physically to the Mariana Islands, we inherit so many memories from the folks that we, we live with, uh, with our families. So just start there, that's a great place to go. And um, you'll find that a lot of our manamku are, they know so much and are hungry to talk, but 
we just have to take the time to, to sit with them and, and talk stories. So that's the first thing is like, turn to your family. And then I would say like, what's your jam? What are you into? What do you like? Are you into tomorrow music? Like look at what maget has got behind him and go on YouTube and listen to the music and see who's commenting and what's going on in that space. If you're more in um, an education setting, like there's so many of us tomorrow's who are in higher ed or that are um, doing this whole academic route thing, like go online and, and look us up and see what's happening. And we have, you know, like I met you, Maget, when I was an undergrad at UCSD because I really enjoyed ethnic studies courses and I wanted to know more. And then I saw your name and I saw Luhan and I reached out. And that's one of those things where you, you don't have to be Mamala, you can send an email and the most generous people I would argue um, are our own and they are hungry and happy to help, right? They are hungry to, to share, they want to connect you. And so I have made so many wonderful friends and been included in and plugged into so many networks because of the generosity of people like you, Maget, of other folks who are um, tomorrow, I would argue my mentors, you know, who have plugged me in. So it all, all it takes is, a, is an email or a message, send that DM, you know, send that message on Facebook because people will respond and they're really happy to do so. Um, and the other thing is because it's 2022 and because of how COVID has gone and everything, I think our, our technology and online spaces is like another really great tool to connect with folks. So use your social media, use whatever platforms you have, go to the talks and hear um, who's, who's giving a talk on this and that. And you know, the museum is a great place. There's always, um, things to watch and listen to. So it really is like, what are you into? Use that Google Drive and like go on there and search things and, and connect, but just find like, what is your thing? Cause more often than not, there's a tomorrow who's already invested in that space that you can connect with. And for me, that means reaching out. For me, that means like talking to tomorrows who are abroad, who are now my friends. Cause I have, I'm a tomorrow seeker according to this talk now, I have sought them out. And now I like schedule monthly chats with folks like Dr. Marina Taikinko, who's over in, in Boston and also works at um, Brown. And I talk with her and we make it a thing every month we connect just to talk because we're hungry for connection. And I think whatever, whatever way you can connect is valid. And whatever you got, if it's a t-shirt or a decal, or maybe it's a dissertation, they're all valid ways of experiencing your tomorrowness. Biba Biba Sidzus Masin, De Sidzus Masin. And so, okay, just, uh, you know, whatever you're into, you know, whatever as whatever you're into, there's a way that you can connect to sort of the larger global Chamorro community through that. Sidzus Masin, Jesse and I, Puri Sin Ikwantosh Mupalgo, thank you so much for joining today. Um, the, you had a lot of uh, support and a lot of fans in the comments, a lot of bibas. <laughs> and so, okay, so you're seeking, you're seeking and your stalking is effective. <laughs> <laughs> but Hungan, and so I'm hoping, you know, uh, on, on Fanatsu, one of the things that I've always tried to do is, is bring in the diaspora and then sort of normalize sort of diaspora Marianas conversation. So it's not like one or the other. It's just kind of one week it's this, one week it's that, and whatever happens, happens. And so, you know, um, you definitely uh you definitely uh inspired a lot of people in the comments with what you said who are back home. And so Sidus Masi Tatlu, uh Sidus Masi nu todos Hamzunio Mega Zanume Ekonga Kestina episode Fanatsu. Esti Fanapo i Chempotaguini Pago, Ajos, Estaki Manadli Hitatlu. Thank you.